Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to our friends in Europe. My name is Julia Friedlander. I am the C. Boyden Gray Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Atlanta Council's Geoeconomics Program. It is my pleasure today to uh, launch an initial conversation after the U.S. elections on transatlantic sanctions coordination, one of the, the hottest button issues that we have in our foreign policy, especially uh, in light of the events of the last administration. I am delighted today to welcome Ambassador Dan Fried, a uh, Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow here at the Atlanta Council and former Sanctions Coordinator at the State Department, Juha Jokela, from the Director of European Programs from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and Alexander Schoenfeder, who is the Deputy Director General of Economic Affairs at the German Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. Today also marks the launch of Ambassador Fried's seminal paper, U.S. Sanctions Policy, the Trump Administration's Record and Recommendations for the Next Administration, and we'll also provide a relaunch of the Finnish paper, Sharpening EU Sanctions Policy for a Geopolitical Era. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Ambassador Fried to begin the conversation with his presentation. Please enter your questions in the chat function as we go into the Q&A. And I hope to bring us into a conversation that is as fluid as possible, given that we are in Zoom world. So without further ado, Dan, please take us away. Thank you, Julia. Um, all right, so the, the paper assesses the Trump administration record on sanctions and then draws both specific lessons for certain of the big sanctions regimes and general lessons. And I'll start with a couple of the general lessons and then go back to them later. The general lesson is with sanctions, first, don't get greedy and impatient. Sanctions are a tool they're not a magic wand that gets the other guy to surrender. They are a tool. They have to work. They have to be linked up with a policy that otherwise makes sense. And as I said, don't get greedy or impatient. They take time and they're not going to give you 100%. The second rule is incrementalism works. Don't, work, don't look at perfect solutions. For God's sakes, this is the real world. And don't believe your own talking points and don't don't swallow what the lobbyists for one side or another give you. Incrementalism works. Another rule is think about the end game. When you go into sanctions, how are you getting out of them? Do you want to get out of them? Leave yourself various off ramps that make sense. And finally, work with allies. It's better doing less with allies than more on your own. Don't burn up your political capital getting in fights with people about sanctions. Work with allies. Um, I was the chief negotiator with European governments and the European Union about the Russia sanctions program, and those negotiations worked. The Europeans kept their word. The Germans kept their word. We did handshake deals. They came through. That surprised Vladimir Putin, who didn't think it would work. So... Okay, the Trump administration in particular sanctions. And I wanna go through this so it isn't just generalities. And I'm going to go from top to bottom because the Trump administration um, didn't mess up all the sanctions in all the same ways. And they have some genuine accomplishments that they can claim credit for. So I'm gonna go from top to bottom quickly. So this may surprise you, but on human rights, I give the Trump administration some reasonable credit because it implemented the Global Magnitsky Act. And it even did so um, with less hesitation than the Obama administration, which didn't really like Global Magnitsky and opposed it. The Trump people, and this is thanks to Sigal Mandelker, the Under Secretary of Treasury who was in charge of sanctions, believed in using sanctions for human rights purposes. Yeah, they could have been better about Russia sanctions and tougher on Saudi sanctions, but they did a lot um, to go after, to use global, GLOMAG to go after various bad actors around the world. I think they left a good foundation for the Biden people to continue. So that's one. A second, where I think the Trump administration deserves at least partial credit is Venezuela. Venezuela is an example probably of sanctions overreach because regime change is our explicit objective with Venezuela. Boy, that doesn't leave a lot of room for incrementalism. So that's a problem. 
On the other hand, I give the Trump administration credit for assembling a, a, a real international coalition um, of Europeans and Latin Americans in support of pressure on the Maduro regime. That's a pretty good accomplishment and it deserves credit. It flies in the face of Trump administration unilateralism and contempt for diplomacy. But, you know, Elliot Abrams, who is in charge of the Venezuela policy, is um, a, a skilled diplomat and he knows how to make this work. So partial credit. Three, DPRK sanctions. I give the Trump administration credit initially because maximum pressure was right. Um, the Obama administration was not tough enough in its sanctions program against the DPRK, and they realized this the last six months of their existence. Julia probably remembers this well. Um, just her office at Treasury when she was there was always tougher during uh, under Obama about uh, North Korea sanctions, and they were right. The Trump administration pushed maximum pressure sanctions. They got the Chinese to pay attention, but then they blew it because Trump himself seemed to get greedy and impatient and he wanted a big flashy win. And he signed on to this Singapore declaration, which was pretty much empty rhetoric with the North Koreans, which was weaker than what the North Koreans had previously agreed, with, agreed to. So they built up sanctions and then they frittered it away because they were greedy and impatient. Next is the China sanctions. There's a lot of legislation out there that is tough on China and the Trump people have moved hard against Huawei and other Chinese companies. They have a point and the, and the proof that they have a point and an argument is that Europe, despite having little use for the Trump administration has shifted its view on China and Huawei in many cases. The problem with the Trump administration sanctions approach to China is that they don't seem to have an end game. What is it they want? They keep blaming the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, really? Regime change? Is that the objective? Some tough steps on China are going to happen under any, would happen under any US administration. They need to show some discipline with the Chinese policy and figure out what it is they want. Um, Russia sanctions, they've continued them. They've continued the Obama era sanctions and sometimes they've extended them, but let's face it, they haven't had the effect desired because Trump's messages on Russia have been, shall we say, mixed and inconsistent. He undermines his own, the message of the sanctions by seeming to be pro-Putin. The, um, the Biden administration is going to take a hard look at the Russia sanctions and figure out where it is we want to work, where we want to squeeze the Putin regime for its various misdeeds, and we absolutely have to work with Europe as we do so. Finally, Iran sanctions. The JCPOA was a flawed deal, but it was a deal. Right now, the Trump administration has squandered the political capital we amassed by working with Europe to push back against Iran, and we have gotten nothing except a lot of press releases out of it. We seem to be counting on sanctions to cause the regime to collapse. That is probably a mistake, almost certainly a mistake. It won't. The, uh, the, the, Obama, the Biden people are going to have to come in and build, my paper recommends returning to the JCPOA, and we will have to see whether it works, um, whether this is possible. All right, I'm going to wrap up and repeat again the general rules that I hope guide uh, the Biden team on sanctions. Don't get greedy or impatient. Incrementalism is okay. Figure out the end game as you get into the sanctions. And for God's sakes, work with allies. It really can be done. It isn't so hard. You know, it, go for it. And finally, though, this is partly self-serving. Yeah, my office at the, the Office of the Sanctions Coordinator at the State Department was abolished and its people scattered. I mean, one of them was sent down to do Freedom of Information Act requests. But what the hell? Um, restore that office and that office should work closely with Treasury and OFAC and NSC and with the Europeans. It's not so hard if you try. Anyway, Julia, that is a brief 
race through the paper. Um, and it was written with the help of the ACE sanctions team at the Atlantic Council. Um, and I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, David Mortlock, Brian O'Toole, Andre Michalescu, and um, you, Julia, um, for adding to the paper and uh, fixing some of my mistakes. So I'm done. Thank you, Dan. Um, please, claim, please claim the honor for the work, however. Uh, you can I turn to you now? Um, I'd love to hear you uh, provide an overview, a pre sort of presentation of the paper that, that you oversaw. Um, note for our American audience that this has been discussed uh, at working levels in the European Union and provides a very comprehensive view of EU sanctions capabilities, shortcomings, and its interactions with the US system. So, Yuha, your floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, and also congratulations for Ambassador Fried for your excellent paper and also very insightful presentation. As Julia mentioned, my task is to bring in the EU as a sanctions center to this discussion, and uh, I would like to make uh, maybe three key observations given the uh, rather limited time we have here. Uh, I think the first observation relates to the fact that within the last 10 years, uh, we have witnessed a notable turn in EU sanctions policies towards harder, yet, however, very targeted economic sanctions. And this is a, a key development that we recognized in the report. And uh, we also discussed quite a bit that that's my second observation, the kind of key challenges what the EU faces at the moment as, as a developing sanctions sender. And I think most notably the, the, the challenge that the EU has faced uh, relates to the more unpredictable, unpredictable US sanctions action and also the subsequent, I would argue, lack of transatlantic coordination. And this is exactly what, uh, what Daniel addressed in his uh, opening remarks. And then, of course, there is the withdrawal of the most prominent and active member state uh, in EU sanctions policy, namely the UK from the EU. And that's also a not notable challenge to the EU's sanctions preparations and decision making. Uh, my final point relates to the uh, EU and its member states' actions to address uh, these challenges. And I think this would provide a kind of a useful context for the discussion of the way forward for also transatlantic uh, sanctions uh, uh, policy. So I think there is a, a quite a bit to be said about these harder and, and targeted economic sanctions uh, of the EU in recent years. Of course, the Iran is the case in place. And this is also very important because it was a very uh, high level uh, uh, diplomatic project actually led by the EU, EU's high representative, uh, Catherine Ashton, and then uh, later on Federica Mogherini. And of course, this proved for the EU that the sanctions really work when they are combined with the, with the political process and also shared objectives, uh, shared uh, foreign policy object, objectives uh, among the key actors like the US and, and the EU in this case. Uh, the second case, what we've already addressed here is, of course, the Russia sanctions because of the Ukraine crisis. And uh, our argument in the, in the report is that this is truly a kind of a qualitative leap forward in EU sanctions uh, policy. Uh, this is because uh, perhaps the first time in history, the EU imposed uh, uh, tough economic sanctions against its neighboring major power and very close trading partner. Again, these sanctions decisions and regimes was coordinated with the US and it also included this broader di diplomatic efforts within the Normandy format which resulted to the Minsk uh, uh, agreement. And what is important here is, I think, also that the, uh, the sanctions have been upheld now for more than six years, as the Minsk agreement has not been implemented as it should have been. My second point, which concerns the challenges of the EU sanctions policies, uh, I think they were very obvious already uh, when, when I heard uh, uh, Daniel Fried's uh, uh, presentation. And this is the close coordination with the US and, and the turn towards more uh, unpredictable pathways uh, in EU sanctions policy, including the kind of the executive office, but also, of course, the, the actions uh, in sanctions uh, stemming from the Congress. And I think this has really put EU in, in a kind of a novel uh, and difficult place in terms of its sanctions policy. 
and, 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 and because of the implications of the secondary sanctions and here in Europe, we have also witnessed the debate sliding into a more sort of a EU's possibilities to uh, shield itself against uh, the actions of other, other sanction centers. Uh, this is something what the EU might think that in the future is, is a kind of a more likely uh, scenario also in terms of other major economic powers in the world. Uh, and of course, the UK exit, uh, this is something which we, we cannot underestimate the implications of it. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, because of the UK's uh, power, powerful position as a member state, the member of the big three within the EU foreign policy uh, machinery, and also its technical skills, including its intelligence assets uh, when it comes to the sanctions uh, listings. And I think what is important to note is that the ongoing negotiations over the EU-UK future relations, they do not cover at the moment foreign and security cooperation uh, in an institutional framework. So, so coordination could continue through informal coordination, but not uh, in the UK's uh, aspiration through institutional arrangement. And this leads to my to me to my final point uh, on the on the kind of the potential uh, uh, EU action to strengthen its sanctions policy, and I'm very much looking forward also uh, uh, Alexander's comments on this. Uh, I think the first argument in the in the in our paper and report is that the first first of all the member states uh, should should aim to replace the UK's uh, uh, position in the EU sanctions system. And this means, like, this means providing political steering and consensus building on EU sanctions policy. This is of course something where the transatlantic uh, coordination can uh, also contribute, but within the EU system, uh, uh, there needs to be political leadership as well. And while there are many eyes looking towards Berlin and Paris, uh, we also see a role for a smaller member states and groups of member states within, uh, within the EU to do that, to provide a steering, uh, a political steering on, on, on certain sanctions uh, portfolios. And here we see a possibility for member states to, to, to specialize on certain types of sanction regimes, for instance, to human rights sanctions and so forth, financial sanctions. And second, we argue that the EU should urgently strengthen its technical capabilities to, to, up, uh, to set up sanctions regimes. And of course, this would be most cost effective at the EU level in Brussels, uh, in the EU institutions, external action service and the European Commission. But we also highlight that it's important to keep an eye on the member states uh, uh, capabilities and resources in sanctions, uh, uh, decision making and preparation. And this relates to the fact that the uh, EU sanctions making is based on unanimity decision making system and the way of, of increasing uh, and, and increasing resources at national level is also a way of, uh, of providing ownership for the membership over the EU's uh, sanctions uh, policies. And third, uh, and, I, uh, and although the unanimity rule, which is quite, live, uh, which is quite widely discussed now in, 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 in Europe and in the EU, has its effective, effectiveness challenges, I think the most recent example being the EU's Belarus sanctions, it also has its merits, and this is something what we, what we uh, uh, elucidate in the report. So although forging sanctions decisions might take, take time uh, in the EU context, securing the support of all member states sends a very powerful message of EU unity in upholding international norms and security. And, and in this context, we also highlight that this is important because of the, because of the implementation of the sanctions decisions. Uh, in the EU, the sanctions uh, implementation is based on decentralized system. So that means that it is the member states which largely uh, implement the sanctions. And that's why the unanimity rule and, and consensus uh, approach has uh, a merits. And finally, why I would say that the incoming US administration might actually provide uh, uh, a more conducive environment for EU to address these challenges as a sanction sender, uh, uh, a couple of remarks on that, and then I stop there. 
I think the Europeans are, are, are very much aware that one cannot not step into the same river twice, uh, as during these four years, uh, quite a lot of water has, uh, has flowed over. But I think they also recognize the prospects of increasing transatlantic collaboration. And this relates in setting up uh, key foreign policy objectives in general, and also to uphold international norms and security, I would say in particular. And this means that in light of these past, past experiences of successful sanctions coordination between the EU and the US, the EU and its member states uh, realized that they need to be ready uh, to be able to use the sanctions tools, tool as effectively as, as, as during the past decade, uh, if deemed necessarily uh, in the future uh, and in, 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 in close coordination also with the, with the US. And I would also like a kind of a final point on this. I mean that, uh, uh, that, that, that the uh, upholding international norms and security and the joint foreign policy objectives, which, which, which are likely to be discussed much more uh, in, the, in the context of transatlantic relations is very, very important here because it also to some extent uh, could kind of uh, shift the debate away from this uh, shielding from economic statecraft, uh, geoeconomics uh, in global affairs in, in general, and return the discussion more to the kind of the, the sanctions policy that the EU uh, EU has been forging uh, uh, during its past uh, 10 years. I'll stop here now and pass the floor for Alexander. Thank you very much, Julia. Oh, welcome, thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, please and put any questions you have in the chat and we'll come to you as we go. Um, I'd like to turn now to Alex. What do you, what do you make of this? Um, um, what, what, is, uh, what makes sense to you, what doesn't? And I'd very much appreciate um, sort of your personal perspective on where things stand in Berlin right now. Well, thank you very much, Julia, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Dan and you have for your very valuable insights into uh, the sanctions world that we live in. Uh, I'd like to first of all comment on Dan's paper. I think it's a great paper. I think it's really, really good. And we appreciate specifically um, the spirit of cooperation, uh, which is, in my view, the main idea of this report. I think it is, it is high time to, to jointly reassess uh, the foreign policy tool of economic sanctions. And I think uh, Dan's paper is a great basis for that. Um, and I fully agree that sanctions are a tool and not more, not less. And uh, in no way can sanctions be a substitute for a broader, comprehensive foreign policy strategy. Uh, sanctions for the sake of sanctions simply won't work. Uh, and uh, sanctions also need to be targeted. Um, the receiving state and the designated unity and entity need to know why they have been designated and sanctions. And they need to know what to do to get rid of the sanctions, to get delisted or to get out of it. Um, and I fully agree with the fact that to achieve maximum effect, uh, sanctions need to be coordinated. Um, and at best, there is a transatlantic coordination on that between Europe and the United States, among allies, among friends. And in my personal view, and um, this specifically comes from uh, my experience over the last four years, uh, coordination um, is more than just giving a heads up uh, five minutes before sanction policies take place. Uh, needless to say, I think is that uh, sanctions against allies are not acceptable from our point of view. We specifically should work hard to achieve Western unity and specifically in face of the sanction regimes that uh, Dan mentioned, specifically in, in the case of Iran, uh, in the case of Russia, and increasingly in the case of China. It's not so much that we don't agree on the analysis of why we need sanction policies against certain uh, countries against uh, certain aggressions. It's more how to do it. It's more how to get in and get out together. 
It's more about a broader comprehensive policy, foreign policy strategy that we need to have in order to make most of uh, sanction policies. And I have to say that uh, actually the German government is, is more than ready uh, to intensify EU-US bilateral sanctions coordination. And specifically, we're looking forward um, uh, to a new nomination of a U.S. sanctions coordinator in the Department of State. Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, Dan, you can make sure that uh, your influence is being heard. Um, and maybe uh, we can meet more often in the future. Um, talking about the points that, that Juha has made, um, it is true that... Um, um, the, uh, the leaving of the United Kingdom is, is of specific uh, interest for us here in Berlin. Um, however, when it comes to sanctions, I don't believe it's a real problem because uh, we have seen in the past that um, uh, specifically in the uh, discussions we had between France, Great Britain and Germany on, uh, on the topic of the JCPOA, that there are uh, really a lot of issues that we think commonly, that we believe there is a foreign policy coordinated uh, approach between those three countries also in the future. I don't, I don't think there is a, is a huge wedge coming um, in and uh, that we get uh, far, far away from, from what Great Britain is going to do in the future. I think there will continue to be a, a large and, and overwhelming coordination of our foreign policies. Because basically it's um, in uh, both of our interests. It's in both of the interests of the European Union and in the interest of, of uh, Great Britain. So I'm not, I'm not really worried there. I'm much more worried when it comes to um, an issue that uh, increasingly um, lets us frown here in, in Berlin. Specifically the fact that China uh, is setting up its own sanction regime. Um, which puts us in a very awkward position, uh, maybe in the future, specifically uh, European and German companies. The awkward position being that we have to choose, to choose between maybe uh, the US market and the Chinese market. And for an export-led economy, uh, this is a very, very hard place to be in. Um, and uh, we are running into uh, really dire straits if um, if uh, we continue on that path, and therefore I I uh, fully agree with uh, with Dan on the fact that we need and on with Yuha as well that we need a very strong transatlantic coordination to counter uh, Chinese influence, to counter Russian influence, to counter Iranian influence in its region, and to make sure that um, this coordination leads to a more effective sanctions policy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex, that's extremely helpful. Um, before I turn over to the questions coming in, I'd like to ask the three of you, why do you think the Trump administration ended up using the sanctions as a reflexive policy tool in the way that it did? What were its limitations? What were the political parameters it was operating between? Uh, and how, I, okay, I Dan can laugh. Uh, I certainly have my personal opinions about why this happened. Um, I'll reserve those for later maybe, but what and how will the Biden administration specifically avoid that temptation, right? How will they be able to recraft a use of the tool to fit more structurally within um, within a foreign policy framework and not let sanctions stand on their own. And I think as Alex mentioned, arrive like a rabbit out of, out of a hat overnight, surprising even the staffers that implement them. So Dan, maybe I'll turn to you first. Uh, the Trump administration liked sanctions because the president likes beating up people. He wants tools to inflict pain. And this looked like a perfectly reasonable way to do it. But doing so without discipline and without integration into a policy which is achievable means that sanctions are just kind of a press release to show that they're tough. I mean, that, look what he did with the, the DPRK sanctions. He blows all of his potential political leverage 
for the sake of a showy event with, you know, Kim Jong Un. Like seriously, um, if the United States wants to use sanctions, it needs to work with the Europeans. And Alexander Schoenfelder is exactly right. Not just tell them ten minutes before sanctions are about to drop, but really negotiate the sanctions in advance. If we could do it on Russia, we can do it in other places. And let's be honest here, as Americans, the Europeans took some hits with the Russia sanctions. Finland took huge hits, but they stuck with it in the name of solidarity. So when you've got allies willing to actually take hits, don't waste that political capital on pointless fights or piss off people for no good reason. I mean, I'm I'm being pretty blunt here.、Um, the Trump administration likes sanctions because it promised a cheap and easy win, and that there's a lot you can achieve in foreign policy, but very seldom within the time frame you've put in your memo to the president or the Secretary of State.、Uh, the Biden people will be. Inclined to work with Europe, and to work, you know, and simply have a better policy process. And if Europe can, as as you have suggested, if Europe increases the sanctions, it, it sanctions capacity.、Um, and the European chief stakeholders put their backs into it. The United States is going to have a willing and eager partner. I mean, we can do this. We can do this. Either of you want to respond to that?、Uh, yes, maybe very briefly. I, I agree with the analysis uh, uh, to great extent, and、uh, of course, I can only speak from the sort of how the situation have looked like here when we when we look the look it from the from the Europe and and also from Finland. I think it's also also kind of a been a kind of aspiration for. For for quick fixes uh, uh, in terms of of of, of achieving,、uh, and also speaking for domestic audiences, kind of highlighting the U.S.、Uh, economic straight state statecraft and power,、uh, uh, and and kind of、uh, proving for the domestic audiences that 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 the president is 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 working uh, uh, strongly and and decisively on certain issues. But I have to say that it's 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 really kind of、um, has.、Uh, Has been a bustle for us foreign policy uh, wonks. Uh, uh, in in where in where are the kind of the where where are the kind of the objectives of these policies? It, you know, when they come、uh, very quickly as a, res- a response to certain、uh, international events. I think in the case of of, of Turkey, for instance,、uh, the threats to use economic power to a maximum effect. Uh, where where is the kind of the the kind of the bigger picture of what what the U.S. wants to achieve, and of course in this discussion to some extent uh, 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 the kind of the America first and the and the, and the increasing global competition、uh, in general the big discussion、uh, about the rivalry between U.S. and China which was also referred by Alexander that kind of、uh, comes with the. With the element that, to what extent uh, uh, things will change during the Biden administration, or what might be carried uh, forward uh, 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 during the Biden administration as well. But what I try to highlight in my presentation that I see that there are real chances to return to this uh, common uh, uh, objective setting on a on a major questions, whether they are. Uh, uh, whether they are sort of、uh, the big uh, economic uh, questions, or, or when we look at the EU sanctions policy and its history, as in particular in terms of the、uh, international norms and security, that's where the EU has employed、uh, sanctions. And I think this provides the, the possibilities to to work together、uh, and build this also this trust and understanding. I think this was also mentioned by Alex that if you learn、uh, five minutes before before that the sanctions are imposed, that really creates a kind of a different kind of landscape for for this uh, uh, trust uh, building among the transatlantic allies.
I did want to highlight that because um, from my own from my own experience, it really was um, about gold leaf and the needing to deliver a president uh, a quick win on an, an often intractable problem. Um, so just coming back to what Dan said, um, patience is key. I'd like to I'm going to turn I'm going to um, turn two questions to Dan coming in from the audience. The first is from Valeria Yegesman. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name from the Voice of America. Do you expect the Biden administration would impose sanctions on Russia to respond to the poisoning of Alexei Navalny and the situation in Belarus? Yes and yes. Uh, the Trump administration is preparing sanctions in response to the Navalny poisoning. They are slow. They are, they, they, it's too slow. Um, Europe has gotten ahead of us. And we should be. We should have worked with the Europeans to act in the same, along uh, around the same time. Um, and they can use. You know, this is this is a, a good case could be made for using GLOMAG, Global Magnitsky Act for that. Um, and for Belarus, Trump administration has done some. The the Lukashenko regime in Belarus is increasing the pressure. There is more violence. There have been deaths. Um, the Biden team is going to have to look hard at the options and work with the Europeans, for God's sakes. Come up, come up with a joint strategy. Sanctions against individuals, san consider sanctions against the Russians enablers of Lukashenko. We have to think this through. And then the, an even tougher question is, at what point do you consider broader sectoral sanctions on um, pieces of the Belarusian economy if, if you can separate you know, if you can do so in a way that doesn't hurt people, that's a question, not a recommendation. And the Biden people are going to be looking hard at that and do it with Europe. There's consensus in Europe to move. Opportunity is there. Seize it. Do it. Um, here I have a question from Maria Shagina. Perhaps, Alex, I'll turn this one to you. Um, you know, maybe building off of what um, of what you have referred to as being a sanctions sender, um, you know, what um, referring to the global uh, uh, global human rights sanctions regime that's set to come into order. Um, what is the scope of cooperation between the U.S. and the EU on on these issues, given that um, the EU regime is not sent to set to target corruption, and that is something specific, a very specific line item in the global Magnitsky legislation. Well, corruption is not everything, um, and I fully agree with uh, with Dan. Actually, my door stands open. I mean, for every uh, Biden delegation coming in here, I'm I'm more than happy to discuss all those issues with the upcoming uh, U.S. Uh, administration. Um, we might be ahead in the Belarus campaign, but uh, to be honest, um, the U.S. can create a lot lot of economic pressure and. Um, the world has seen that uh, from uh, many um, maximum pressure campaigns and without diplomatic efforts and coordination with allies, this pressure will uh, not contribute to broader foreign policy goals. And that's exactly what, uh, what we have to do here. We have to work together um, to make sure that um, um, we reach our foreign policy goals. And actually, to be honest, uh, we are ready for more U.S. leadership in that as well. I mean... Again, we have seen that in the past and we agree in large part uh, on the ana analysis. Uh, we have not agreed uh, with the Trump administration's approach to that, um, to, to um, make America great again is a good thing, but America first all the time is probably not a good thing. So there, there are many, many issues that we have to discuss, not only in the sanctions front, there are many others. Um, and I would like to make one more point here. Um, um, in, in his paper, Dan has actually mentioned the U.S. Congress a lot. And um, I mean, the U.S. Congress often is the driving force with regard to sanctions. So it's not only the U.S. administration or, or the old or the new one. Uh, we, we have to make sure that uh, parliamentary action is in line with broader foreign policy goals. I think this is, this is very, very important. And specifically, um, the German Bundestag also gets more and more interested in this topic. And I was on a hearing uh, a few months ago uh, where people asked me, well, what do you do uh, in, the, in the sanctions field? And they actually didn't um, ask 
me about what do we do against Russia? What do we do against Iran? They were asking, how do we make sure that the extraterritorial effects of US sanctions don't hurt uh, the German economy? I think this is something that, that we really have to make sure um, to make sure that the US Congress is, um, is in line with uh, the broader foreign policy goals of the uh, new administration. I think this is very important. Thank you. Um, and maybe we can we can turn then to um, there were a couple of questions from um, uh, from the audience regarding um, regarding secondary measures and instex. Um, one from um, from two different um, two different angles. So maybe um, Dan, if I can start with you and and um, get your impression on whether whether those defensive mechanisms that are currently under discussion. Um, in EU circles will be necessary under the Biden administration. Again, Alex has, has um, explained the, the executive legislative dichotomy for us. And then Yuha, I'd like you to weigh on them as well about the, um, about the true um, implications and um, whether, these, whether these measures will be successful or not. Um, there's a bit of a cottage industry of people who think that the problems with the Trump administration use of sanctions, its abuse of sanctions will lead to um, measures to work around the US dollar and INSEX was cited as an example and it didn't work out that way. It's you know, the ruble, the renminbi are not going to be alternatives to the dollar. Cryptocurrency is not going to be an alternative to the dollar, not in the short run. Um, the, the that is not one of the near term or serious problems with sanctions. That is the, the collapse of the um, financial system with the enormous US role in it. That's unlikely to happen. But, but the Trump administration makes a mistake that it concludes that therefore it needn't pay any attention to Europe. Um, that's just crazy. The purpose of sanctions is, and this is what Alexander was saying, is to achieve something in the world. And you can achieve it better if you're working with Europe. And then when you've got the US and Europe working together, other you are much more likely to get all the other centers of economic and financial power in the world lined up with you. Okay, that, that, That's what's going to happen, or is more likely to happen if we're working together. Um, with respect to the Congress, look, um, the Biden administration is going to have a lot of influence with the House of Representatives. It's in the hands of the Democrats. We'll see about the Senate. Um, sanctions legislation. I'm an executive branch guy by 40 years of experience. I'm not big on um, congressional legislation. Uh, I'm Sometimes the Congress has stepped in and it's been important, like, for example, to prevent Trump from unilaterally rescinding the Russia sanctions which he otherwise, otherwise might have done in 2017. So CATSA, the Russia sanctions bill is, you know, it's it's got lots of flaws, but I was basically for it for that reason. I'm not sure what is going to happen with the two major Russia sanctions bills now in Congress, DASCA and DETER. It's not clear to me that uh, how seriously Congress will push them. They're gonna wait and see how the Biden administration um, behaves. My advice to the administration is to do what we what we were able to do on Russia sanctions, which was go and brief the Hill and let them know what you're up to, and they'll be less inclined to second guess you, at least the ones who are acting in good faith. The Congress didn't trust the Obama administration on Iran, and you got a lot of tough sanctions. But the Biden administration will have a some window to get something done with Congress. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about that. And with respect to secondary sanctions, you know, if I've got little sympathy for some of the companies who have tried, who have played games with respect to sanctions, including European sanctions. But generally, um, if the US is working with Europe, then the, closely, then the problem of second, of secondary sanctions so-called doesn't arise as frequently because Europe and the US are working in parallel fashion. And so it becomes a much diminished problem.
Yes, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a that's a very uh, relieved, I think, message for uh, the Europeans feel very relieved to hearing this message. And I think this has been a really a difficult uh, issue, the secondary sanctions, and, and there were questions about the instec and instex and also the, the EU's possibilities to shield its businesses from the US secondary sanctions. And I think it is already important that there's been some action, there's been attempt to move to that way. But I think the, the kind of the general consensus on this issue is that it's very difficult, uh, even for the EU as a major economic actor and its member states to shield it where it sealed itself from the secondary sanctions of the US. And this is precisely because of the US privileged position in the global financial system and the role of the dollar. So, so I think that's my analysis of it. What I think is quite interesting in terms of EU's current uh, debate related to the Union's global role as well, I know that there has been a lot of discussion and, and, and sometimes uh, 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 misunderstandings as well when we discuss about the EU strategic autonomy, which is one of the big uh, buzzwords of today's EU discussions. And uh, to best of my knowledge, uh, the kind of the defense uh, side of it, uh, which relates and the worries of the duplication uh, in, in relation to NATO, are not sort of uh, top questions at the moment. It's much more about the EU's uh, uh, capabilities for autonomous actions in general in foreign policy. And now under the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, it's been quite a bit about also EU's uh, uh, economic resilience and kind of strategic autonomy in terms of uh, supply chains and value chains in global economy. And there is, of course, the, the Franco-German plan to, 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 to discuss about the competition policy and create these European champions. So this is, this is very much kind of a link to that. But when it comes to the kind of the discussion on, 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 on secondary sanctions, I think that the kind of the and how it relates to this is that I think there is a sort of a shared understanding among the key players in the EU that the EU needs to build up its kind of economic role and tools. And this includes the external role of the euro, as well as the Commission's, uh, European Commission's resources, especially the Director General of, of, of Financial uh, Markets. In a way, what kind of tools the EU has in its position uh, and this is not only related to the, to the US secondary sanctions, but more broadly to the more uh, competitive global milieu, where the kind of the exercises of sanctions or other economic tools uh, uh, might need, might, the EU need, might need to, might need to uh, uh, shield itself. And, and this, is, this is a kind of a discussion that we see not so much about, I would say, the secondary sanctions, which have proven very difficult to resist. And I think everybody here in Europe hopes that the Biden administration and, 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 and do, uh, with the Biden administration, this, this uh, uh, challenge will wither away and, 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 and the kind of the transatlantic coordination will make the secondary sanctions from US perspective unnecessary. Thank you. Um, we've had a question from the audience about um, sanctions on the International Criminal Court. So um, I'd like to start, I know, cover your eyes. Um, the, the question here is what, um, and I'll sort of frame this in, in, a, in broader terms, what aspects of Trump, Trumpism um, sanctions policies are gonna have to remain? And what are we gonna be able to uh, look to reform um, in, the very, in, the, in the near future? That's for Dan. And then maybe, um, and Juha and Alex, maybe you can respond and say, you know, what is the opportunity, you know, you know within a broader transatlantic dialogue to reach an equilibrium in the, in the application of sanctions and those, and who brings what to the table? So before January 20th, um, the sanctions team of the Atlantic Council ought to come up with a paper listing the Trump administration executive orders to be rescinded on day one. Okay, I don't know what's all in that list, but top of that list is that ICC executive order. I mean, that was just shocking. Okay, what the hell? Um, don't treat the ICC the same way you treat thugs and dictators. Uh, well, good God, what self-indulgence. Anyway, come up with a list of bad things as, to pose, as for the good things, 
hey, I gave the Trump administration due and deserved credit for some of its sanctions policy, human rights for one. I think some of the sanctions uh, against um, violators of human rights in Hong Kong and the Uyghurs are merited. And I, and I think the, the, in, the, that, in that the Trump administration has a case. Um, I think the Biden people, you know, if, if you set up a system of concentration camps for an entire people, which seems to be the case uh, in, in China, you know, with respect to the Uyghur communities, there's going to be a reaction and there should be. So, you know, there's some good and then a lot of stuff that simply should be taken away. Um, and yeah, we ought to come up. Julia, I think the sanctions team at the Atlantic Council ought to do that. Come up with a throw it over the side on day one list. Fortunately, we might not be able to do as much as we can or as much as we want to. Um, Alex, you are achieving equilibrium. I fully agree with Dan on the ICC issue. I think that's um, absolutely necessary because you can't sanction those who uh, actually bring to court people that we actually sanctioned in the first place. So that, that doesn't make sense from any kind of angle. And uh, it's, it's absolutely necessary that we have to, to revoke that and work together maybe on, on maybe improving the ICC and making it more an institution that we all can agree on. Um, and I think this is something that we really, really have to work on. Um, I, um, I also want to, to comment on, on Juha's remarks on uh, European sovereignty. Um, it seems like he has read the latest uh, paper that we wrote to my minister on that, so it probably he cited all from, <laughs> he cited from that. No, to be, I'm, I'm just joking, but absolutely right what you said about that, and I fully agree, and uh, I can't really underline uh, much, much more than, than what you have said. Thank you. Uh, brief, have, oh, please go ahead. Brief answer to Alex. Yes, we have a project here at the VIA, led by a German uh, a researcher, senior fellow who, who is following and who is working on the strategic autonomy. It's a very, very topical topic also if we think about the Nordic Baltic uh, uh, region uh, within the EU. So, yes, we are following that very, very closely. Uh, but also, Julia, you asked what, uh, uh, whether who brings what to the table, whether that kind of discussion should be should be launched. And I think this is also something in the chat box that my colleague from Finland, uh, from the foreign ministry, Juha Reiner, highlighted, and he asked that whether there could be a kind of a, a sort of a, a sanction strategy stand by EU and US independently, uh, uh, which could kind of highlight the kind of uh, uh, the purpose of the sanctions policy and also what 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 the actor can bring into the table. Of course, I think these kind of discussions would be very beneficial. They would also be very beneficial for the kind of uh, forging the transatlantic uh, collaboration and trust after this uh, uh, rocky uh, four years of, of unpredictable sanctions action. So I, I think that would be a good, good way forward. And I would also like to mention that there is of course interesting uh, uh, development in terms of the Brexit because in some fields of, of sanctions policy, the UK might be a, a quicker actor than EU uh, in some portfolios. And I think the, the human rights uh, sanctions were mentioned here. Uh, the UK has already the Man Mangitsky Act. And, uh, and also I think that in, in certain respects, the, e the UK and its independent sanctions policy, which I believe also will be aligned with the EU to a great extent might be actually a sort of uh, set some benchmark that benchmarks that the EU also has to uh, address in its internal uh, discussions of its of its sanctions policy. But with regard to the, the Brexit, I think there is also a very important uh, element to that. And uh, just, just getting back to that very quickly on, on the kind of the coordination among the E3, which used to be EU3, I think all the member states realize that that is of course the key constellation for, for any major foreign policy decisions within the common foreign and security policy. But now when the situation changes that the EU, uh, that the UK moves outside of the EU structures, it it's creates a little bit of a, a, a challenge in terms of that if this coordination will happen in the future related to the sanctions, but perhaps more generally also EU foreign policy, 
uh, also outside of the EU structures in a way that it is a co collaboration among the main capitals. It's, it's kind of recognized, but then of course there is the question how that links to the official EU foreign policy machinery. And, and this is of course important when we are operating in the system with the unanimity and also when it comes to the implementation of, of, of sanctions decisions, but also other foreign policy decisions. So I think this is why in many member states, actually the institutional link between the UK and the EU in foreign policy, also including sanctions policy is seen as very important. And we all know here that it is because of the UK that this is no, now discussed uh, in, the, in, the, in the negotiations concerning the future relations, but perhaps there, if the deal is reached, there might be a possibility to upgrade uh, that relationship also and include this kind of uh, institutional, institutionalized uh, collaboration uh, features to that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Yuha. And that was, a, was a, related to a question from our colleague uh, Ian Bond in London. Um, unfortunately, we are, we are out of time. Um, we could go on for, a very, for much longer discussing these issues. Um, and I know that our, our audience probably, um, and I apologize to those of our audience that answered questions that I wasn't able to bring in directly, but I tried to, I tried to weave all the themes together. Um, I'd like to graciously thank Ambassador Fried, uh, Juha Jokola, and Alexander Schoenfeder for an exciting conversation. Is the, probably the first of many on turning a new leaf in transatlantic sanctions coordination. I'm really glad that the Atlantic Council was able to jump in um, after the election. We planned this before we knew the outcome. So um, I think we're, we're landing on, on good footing. Um, thank you very much and uh, wish you all well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.